It's May the 10th, 2012. This is 508, a show about Worcester. Today we are at the Woo Church with Eric L'Esperance, Brendan Melican. How are you, sir? Good. You look, we have sinister shadows over your face. I appreciate it. You that. have nothing but black behind you, just like a floating Max Headroom sort of thing going on. Also today on the show, Joy Marietta and Lucas Glenn. How is everybody today? Really good. Wonderful. Well, today on the show, we're going to talk about, we are going to talk about Jose Canseco. People were mad that we said we were going to talk about it the last time, and we spent too much time talking about Zen and school policy. We're going to talk about Sunshine Week. We're going to talk about Extreme Restaurant. We're going to talk about uh, Brad Wyatt's Tea Party Coup. We're going to talk about this church, The Woo. We're going to talk about how to meet people in Worcester. And Brendan is, has a, a public service announcement about driving. What do you want to talk about first, Brendan? Can I get the public service announcement off my chest? Go for it. So look, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, multi-lane highways, the left lane, it's not a high-speed lane. It's a passing lane. And that's different from other states. Some states, it's a high-speed lane. So if you're on the pike and you're in the left lane and you're driving 70 miles an hour thinking you're Danica Patrick, all those people behind you, they're not sitting behind you cheering you on. They're trying to get home to their families. So please move over to the right so people who like to drive a little bit faster can get home to the people they love. That's all. Thank you. I want to ask you guys about this place, the Woo. Lucas, you're the pastor here, yeah? I am. People ask me about the Woo. I think they see emails or they see ads and things about it. And I, I think I've gone to services here maybe a dozen times down through the years. So people always ask me, they're like, you, you know about this place, right? You know about this place, right? I, sometimes, yeah, <laughs> I, I do. What is, what, is, what is this? What is going on here? Um, well, it's a church, though we don't use that label in our, our ads now just because that carries with it some stereotypes that I don't think we fulfill completely, maybe in some ways, but in other okay. ways, no. So we're a Jesus-centered community. So okay. um, you, you know, meet in a church building. We do. On Main Street? On Main Street, Main South by Clark. Okay. This is like, the, right now we're in the basement of the congregational church? That's right. Okay. And you, you guys are also sometimes upstairs? Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. And so besides being a Jesus-centered community, what, 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 else, what else defines what goes on here in your mind? Um, so there's the Sunday service that's part of the church and then there's a lot of other things going on as well um, those other things might be just as important maybe more important than the Sunday service but the mm -hmm. Sunday service happens here um, and we also use this place for offices and we have some groups that meet here classes that happen here as well yeah. it's open up for the community as well so if anybody is looking for a space um, I think it costs something, but we don't get the money because to the Pilgrim Church who owns the building. But if you need a space, check us out. So here's what I would say. You, t you guys correct me if I'm wrong. I would say that things that I notice about this place is young, young congregation, like early 20s con kind of congregation, contemporary music during the services, um, not a lot of hellfire and brimstone from the pulpit. Maybe that's changed since I was here last. I don't think it's changed. But a pretty, like a pretty, <laughs> pretty inclusive and welcoming situation here for people who are Christian? Uh, or for people that are not Christian, um, the last poll that I did, because once a year I like to find out like who's here, um, half the people here were not churchgoers before they came here. Oh, really? So, yeah, which is odd in the church world, I've asked around. So actually, yeah, we have people from different faith backgrounds and quite a few people that were just brought up without faith. They weren't atheists necessarily, but um, they just didn't have that as their background. Okay. I want to ask you guys some personal religious questions. And this is the, this is going to be a great show because it's all politics and all religion. The two <laughs> things you're not supposed to talk about. And you can and you can avoid the question if you like. I might. <laughs> I want to I, I just I want to ask you how you got involved with this community. Okay, I was um, I lived right outside of Worcester in mm -hmm. a small town called Millbury, and I actually um, I was looking for some friends, my wife and I. And so I prayed, something I do regularly, and I asked God, God, would you connect me with some people sort of our age with the same sort of um, values and stuff like that? We're feeling pretty disconnected and could really use that. Mm. Um, and I ended up at a party with some friends that were from, like, my past. Okay. And Lucas was at that party. And so I misjudged him because he was drinking a Budweiser. And, and did, did he have big dreadlocks at the time? At the time, he had long hair, so okay. he was pre-dreadlock at that point. <laughs> and now he's post-dreadlock. Now he's post. <laughs> For the <Okay>. fourth time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and so I got talking to Lucas, and I realized that he, what he was describing here at the Woo, 
um, was something that I really feel compelled for. Mm -hmm. And so I came and mm -hmm. um, been here for like three years now. And I have more friends than I know what to do with. That's fantastic. Yeah. This is actually this is actually a topic we're going to talk about later on the show. It's oh, like cool. the frustration that people in this area have, like meeting people who they can relate to. Mm. Nicole Apostle is going to assume this is a setup. She won't believe that. We did not. Happened. Yes. <laughs> Joy, can I ask you this? Also, the same question about how you got connected with this place. Sure. Um, I moved here after I got out of college. My dad also pastors uh, in the city. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was just looking, like Eric was just looking for a community that kind of shared uh, the same kind of values um, and just people I connected with on a deeper level. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a couple friends who went to the Woo. Um, they invited me and went once and didn't really, I don't know, just couldn't stop coming back, so. Mm. I like this, this is a good story. I, so I, I should actually ask you this as far as like a technical questions, which is, um, how many people, how many people like are part of the congregation these days, would you say? I have no idea. <laughs> I used to count when I would go here because I always count. Anytime I'm at a demonstration or a church service, I always count the number of people there. Yeah, no, we count how many people come on a Sunday, but it's, I mean, we had over 200 people here last month in a service, mm -hmm. and then I think the next week we had 89 people. And so it goes up and down. It goes up and down. <laughs> and you have like a lot of like people who are in college or grad school yeah, or something. Yeah, a lot of people who are in transition. So, yeah, yeah. So the academic year determines. We do, and what she's saying too, you know, people from different programs in the area or just uh, are in a tough place in life. And so, yeah. you know, so, and also just with a lot of people that don't have a faith background, church going is not a weekly thing. And so right. if somebody starts going to church once a month, they're like, got really religious all of a sudden in their life, you know? <laughs> Compared to how they were. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, we just have a lot of people that are, you know, so we just don't know. Yeah. How did, how did this how did this project start? How did this community start here? Um, so, yeah, I was traveling around the United States doing motivational multimedia shows okay. in schools, just trying to encourage people to make good decisions or whatever. And um, I came through Massachusetts, and I got stuck here. I just felt like this is the place for me, and okay. I fell in love with it. And uh, one of the things about it is I... I learned so much from the people around me in this community that I just felt like, for me, it was the best place to be. Mm -hmm. And Worcester uh, seemed like a very diverse community, which is something really important to me. I mm -hmm. lived in Jamaica over the years for like 20 years. My wife lived in India. And we were looking for uh, a vibrant community with a lot of international folks. So mm -hmm. Worcester seemed like a great place as any to, do, to be here. And so mm -hmm. yeah, we moved there. We started. Um, with doing kids programming here in this building, and then we uh, started doing meals on Saturday nights for mm -hmm. a lot of folks in the community, and then it grew into a church. Right, and, and you guys are part of a, a, a network of churches called the Vineyard Churches, right? Right, yeah, loosely. It's a uh, movement more than a denomination, so there's okay. not a lot of hierarchy, but right. um, it's based upon relationship. You know, we kind of yes. connect with each other and, and help I mean, each other. And were, were, were there Vineyard people who were mentoring you whenever you felt called to start a, a community? Yeah, so when I got stuck here in Massachusetts, I was actually th uh, then employed at a vineyard church in Hopkinton. Okay. Uh, and we didn't feel like that was a place that really fit us all that well. Okay. So that's why we started looking around, like, where can we move to? And Worcester felt like it fit us. Mm. Uh, and just, again, I just really enjoy the people, and I, I grew so much as a person being here. Um, so, yeah, just became home. I'm closing in on a house tomorrow, so hopefully on Crystal awesome. Street I get to buy my first house. A nice old triple decker that's got a lot of work to do in it, but very <laughs> nice. Okay. Very nice. Brennan, do you have any questions? You, how's the relationship with other denominations in the city? So I mean, like other uh, religious uh, affiliated folks throughout the city, not just the yeah. Vineyard. For the most part, it's really good. So I'm a part of some like pastor groups mm -hmm. where we try to like get together once in a while and encourage each other. Most pastors are pretty discouraged people a lot of the time. Mm. Uh, undiagnosed codependence sometimes, you know, and they mm. just need, you know, kind of some encouragement. So I, I like being a part of that. I I need it myself. Um, and generally, I think all the the pastors in this community are friendly people. Like mm -hmm. they mean well. Um, so I like them. They're they're cool people. Yeah. And uh, once in a while, we try to work together. It's oh, I don't know. That's the other thing about pastors. They're not very administrative, and mm -hmm. so like working out the logistics to actually work together seems like something that's impossible. But with God, supposedly nothing's impossible, so maybe that's what happens someday. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. And if I could just throw something in there, um, 
there is something happening. There's a movement in Boston called Unite Boston, mm -hmm. and that has more to do with the musicians in churches. And so Boston, there's been a few nights where musicians from all these different churches come together and sort of host an event. And Worcester is gonna be doing their first type of thing. People in Boston said, this is great, and we'd like to try this in Worcester, and so. Interesting, Could, yeah. can I jump in as well? Sure. Uh, I think your question makes me think of another question, which is how is our relationship with just the community of Worcester, mm -hmm. which um, I think is important because that's one of the things that I've had a problem with churches before, which is it seems like an us, them kind of thing. Like sure. I, I'm a follower of Jesus, you're not. So um, I think that's something that we wouldn't like here at our church. I think there's only us, mm -hmm. you know, it's people in the community. And so how we just work with other organizations, whatever, the, the organization is nonprofit, whatever. Um, that's important to us, and also just like how we are involved in like the community as well. So our musicians are, I guess, connecting with other musicians and churches. But they also these guys are a band and they perform out and they do a lot of shows. And so I think that's just part of you know our culture of church. It's not really just like connected with sure. each other. That was know. actually the crux of my question. Was I professionally had some uh, the opportunity to do some work out in Boston with the Greater Boston Interfaith organization and you know, the role that they play within their various communities, but then as a movement as a whole, even though there's a lot of disconnect in terms of their individual faiths, uh, sure. the, what they bring to the table in terms of their ability to move uh, issues forward in the community is, is huge. I was just curious if there was anything like that going along here in Worcester. There is Worcester Interfaith, and um, I think they're vibrant at times and other times not yeah. as much, but yeah, I just recently got connected with them, so I'm just trying to mm -hmm. find out what they're doing. I want to. We get. I think we got to talk about other stuff for a little bit, and then we're going to come back and talk about what's going on at the Wood these days. I think the top item, the most requested item, Jose Canseco. Brandon, on me. What is this? What is what is Jose Canseco? <laughs> what does this mean? Um, I, no, well, so Jose Canseco is going to be playing this year for the Tornadoes. He's uh, like a famous professional baseball player from back in the day. And he played for the Red Sox for a while. Yeah, uh, but he's been around for a bit. If Rich Gedman was still coaching, I think this would make my grandfather's like dream team from 1986, right? Jose Canseco and Rich Gedman playing on the same baseball team. But um, so the this is the Can Am League. They're down to like four teams now. So it almost it gives the impression almost that they're going all in and like they're hoping to make this a, a big splash yes. for, for Worcester. It's kind of confusing as to like how it's going though. Like so as soon as that announcement happened, I bought tickets for like the season opener, thinking like this is gonna be. Like When's the season opener? May twenty first. All right, people got to check. I'm this thinking, out. you know, Jose Canseco's gonna be fighting a kangaroo out in center field. Like this is gonna be the <laughs> show like that Worcester's been waiting for. I checked in yesterday. It seems like half the stadium is still for sale. So people need to get on that. Like if you're gonna. This is the one chance you have to actually see a guy uh, taking out cars on two nineties with, with home runs. This guy, he's old, but he's still strong. Yeah, well, he said, you know, right in the Telegram article when they made the announcement that he is he, he is still taking a uh, testosterone, but he's doing this. He said in an article. Well, yeah, in the <laughs> interview. But he said he's, he's doing it for therapeutic purposes because his body no longer produces testosterone on its own. So he's still juiced up and he's ready to go. And it's uh, this is gonna be great. And He's a, he's a heavy Twitter user. He's a huge Twitter <laughs> user. I mean, you can antagonize this guy very easily. Uh, and now that he's going to be in Worcester, you can antagonize him, probably run into him at a bar that night, and have him beat the tar out of you. It's, it, How, the potential for Worcester this summer this is amazing. Just don't fail us, Worcester. Make All it right. happen. There it is. Jose Canseco, <laughs> check. Sunshine week. All right, so this is something we've been bird-dogging on this show for months now. The, 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 uh, the different petitions that people brought forth this year for Sunshine Week, the week that we all work on government transparency. Uh, this week, the Rules Committee of the City Council met and talked about some sun, some stuff. They actually talked about these Ron Madnick petitions <laughs> about transparency from two years ago, I think. Um, and then they all, also some recent petitions that he put in, which are similar, which were basically all about should people have the right to speak at council meetings? I guess right now people are, you can speak at a council meeting, but it's sort of at the discretion of the mayor. And we should have an answer to that question in 2014. Well, here it is. So the, the, oh. rules, the rules committee recommended that um, Petitioners should have an opportunity to speak for up to three minutes the first time their petition appears on the city council agenda. And people should recognize people to speak for no more than two minutes concerning any and all topics appearing on the agenda. There's also these, I don't know if this is part of the same thing. There's also one where they were recommending, they, they're, they're, I think on a trial basis, they're gonna recommend for the mayor to have like an open forum at the beginning of the council meeting and they're gonna see how it goes. Apparently, other local cities do this 
um, have an open forum, and it's not crazy. People brought, people brought up the fact that our good friend friend of the show, Bill Coleman, is the reason that they, they had stopped letting people speak at council meetings like this. But uh, anyway, so Ron Maddox thing made it through. My petition about the city should do a better job archiving videos of council meetings, recommend approval as requested. Joe Scully had a petition about the city having a social media retention policy, and they recommend that the city manager request the solicitor to give them some guidance about um, social media policy, like what exactly this would, as public records, what exactly should we be doing with social media, over and above the current media, social media policy, which is basically don't embarrass the city. This is a good <laughs> opportunity for the city of Worcester to make Twitter not fun anymore, so there you have that David Moore. Joe, Joe Hart had an, uh, sort of an unrelated, but maybe slightly related petition that we should have a public hearing about the, pro the protocol for people to speak, and they said they had, they'll talk about that at another meeting. Jeremy Shulkin had one where he wanted there to be a, uh, somebody need to get that. Right. Jeremy, Jeremy needed. Jeremy wanted the city to basically have a point person, a liaison for public records requests, and um, the rules committee recommends that the city manager designate a liaison for public records requests. Apparently, there is a there is somebody who, again, de facto has this job now, and the idea would just be to actually formally say part of your job is to be the point person for public records requests. So anyway, we're uh, well, I think we're four for four. Or four or five or five for five so far. We got Strong work. next next week's city council meeting. We'll find out what they do with this stuff. Um, it, more of the band is coming in in the background. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna video them because they don't know what we're doing here. Um, tea party coup. I want to talk about and then we'll talk about extreme restaurant. Does that seem like a reasonable order? Can't think of any better order to do things. This is a great front page article in the Telegram. Our friend Brad Wyatt, friend of the show. It's called Businessman Leads Conservative Activists, 18 GOP Caucus Candidates Defeated. Basically, this is about how uh, the, the process of sending delegates to the Republican National Convention from Central and Western Massachusetts. Brendan, you know about this stuff, so interrupt me if I'm getting this ahead. wrong. Yeah. Um, and basically, they, the, the, the local Republicans basically pick individual people to be these delegates to the National Convention. And when they go to the National Convention, I don't exactly know how the Republicans do it, but basically it's something along the lines of when you, when you go there, you've got to vote proportionally to the number of delegates. So this is like talking about 18 delegates. So people voted in a primary, and they split up those 18 amongst the candidates based on who got the most votes. And then when you go there, part of your job is just to formally say, yes, I am the human being representing an 18th of the people in Central and Western Mass who voted in the Republican primary. Um, at some point, though, you actually get personal discretion. Usually, perhaps, if, if the voting goes into later rounds or there's things involving the uh, party platform, you get personal discretion. And this is about how Brad Wyatt, again, friend of the show, watches the show, masterminded this thing where everybody who was a Romney fan amongst who was running to be one of these delegates was defeated. And all of the people who are going to be delegates are either Ron Paul fans, Tea Party members, or members of the ultra-conservative Massachusetts Republican Assembly. And there's a, there, the, the next paragraph says, uh, unlike some of his colleagues, Mr. Wyatt, a genial, he is genial, 41-year-old Boylston School Committee member and developer tends to shy away from anti-establishment rhetoric, but he does not apologize for his hardball tactics, including the element of surprise in taking many of the Republican delegate, the Romney delegate candidates unawares. I don't believe this. Brad White has talked to me about this at length. He, Brad doesn't really even know me. I can't imagine this is. You're part of a secret coup. You he's talked to me. It in public they didn't realize <laughs> for long periods of time about this whole strategy. So I, I can't imagine. It's been discussed openly I mean, uh, uh, throughout Ron Paul circles nationally that one of the goals of the, of the Ron Paul crowd is to try and find a way to force a brokered convention uh, yeah. this summer, uh, if for no other reason than to just shake up the establishment and you know, go back to square one, but when it, actu when it actually matters, right? Like not just going primary to primary, but when the delegates are sitting there, actually force right. everybody's hand and, and go back to voting. Right. It doesn't mean that you know, Ron Paul would actually come out of, of that convention, but brokered conventions are not common, and they tend to get really, really hostile, and it might end up being one of the best ways for Ron Ball to get uh, more attention, so it seems to be something that's been a bit of a national movement. It seems that it, on a local level, it seems as though everybody is getting, being surprised nationally as this happens in all the states where, you know, the primaries are, are, are far behind us and whatnot, um, and the caucusing is taking place without a lot of media attention, but again, on a national level, this has been kind of discussed openly for quite some time now. I'm sort of fascinated by this for two reasons. One is here's a sentence from Mr. Sean Sutner's article. He says, the role of the Paul supporters at the convention, Mr. Wyatt says, will be limited to promoting two planks on the GOP platform. 
auditing the Federal Reserve Bank, and barring U.S. involvement in wars without congressional approval. What's interesting that those are the two ones, because again, those are not really so much Tea Party things to my mind. It was also interesting to me because I was actually involved with just this kind of thing in the 2004 Green Party National Convention. I was a delegate, and I joined the Green Party and became a delegate, specifically because a friend of mine who was very involved in this whole thing of saying, like, we need to get delegates who, if it comes down to people voting their personal preference, are going to go a certain way. So I just think it's awesome that that's what's going on here. I want to read this Extreme Restaurant review. <laughs> and then I want to talk about. Have you been to Extreme Restaurant? I haven't. I've walked Has by. Has anyone been to Extreme Restaurant? I haven't, no. I want to talk about Extreme Restaurant. Then we're going to. It's just open, like, right now. Then we're, then we're going to talk about the Wu some more, and then we're going to talk about meeting people um, in Worcester. Can I get this on my phone? Extreme Restaurant. Here it is. This is a review. This is written by a friend of mine. I emailed her, but I haven't heard back from her, so I'm not going to mention her name in this review. This is Extreme Restaurant. This is a Puerto Rican place opened, recently opened at the corner of May and Maine. And it's called Extreme Restaurant, and the sign is totally extreme. Here's the review. Spoiler alert, the place is fancy-ish inside. They have cloth napkins and tablecloths and placemats. Not much veg-friendly food besides the appetizers and sides, and even with those, there isn't much. You should get the plantains. They were delicious and artfully displayed. We got free salad and toasted bread stuff, which was very yummy. Watch out. If you casually order water, it will come in a bottle and cost $1. There are a few flat screen TVs playing reggaeton booty shaking music videos. We saw so much booty shaking. <laughs> At one point, the waitress fast forwarded one of the videos of a lady in a pool in a bikini because the booty shaking got a little too risque. <laughs> extreme restaurant is hardly extreme in the ways I hypothesized it would be if it actually opened, but it is probably worth going once. So I will, I will eventually go to the I drove by the day I read that uh, review, and there, uh -huh. were, there were balloons, like pastel balloons up yes. front that seemed so not extreme. The sign is extreme, but... Do you know what's in those pastel balloons? <laughs> hydrogen. Hydrogen, yeah. yeah. It looked more like a child's birthday party was taking place inside. I just, a very young child. I just love the name. It's incredible. Um, let's talk about the Wu a little bit, and we'll talk about meeting people in Worcester. What do you think? Um, Sounds like a plan. What's going on at the Wu coming up that people should know about? Uh, one thing that's coming up is uh, Main Idea. This is our second year running um, an art camp, an art day camp for kids, uh, ages like third grade to fifth grade. Um, just a handful of us at the WU are going to host an art camp for kids uh, in the Maine South area. We're getting like different organizations, different like um, different art organizations in the area to like participate and uh, partner with them. So. How, do, how do people how do people get involved with that if they're curious? We right we have a, a website. Mm -hmm. uh, mainidea.org, www.mainidea.org. We also are on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, all our information is there. If you want to volunteer, please volunteer. We need your help. Um, right. and it's going to be a good time. Dance, music, drama. Creative writing. Creative writing. Visual art. Visual art. And like, we, were, we were talking about this earlier. That you guys were saying that you don't have to be a member of the church. Right. It, it's a secular program. There's, right. no, there's no praying to Jesus. There's no Bibles. Or Bibles or anything like that. No. It's an art camp. It's an art camp. And it's awesome. Really quick question. But so, um, and the answer to this is probably going to seem obvious, but you said that a lot of the people who come here actually don't have a religious background, so the answer might not be that obvious. But when is the right time for people just to walk in the door and see what's going on? For a Sunday service? It's just, well, so, see, that's the answer. But, I mean, again, a lot of people who might not be familiar oh, yeah. with. <laughs> so we, we, we do a Sunday service because it's traditional. Yeah. But our service is at noon on Sunday, so you could almost wake up for it. Yeah. <laughs> Which most of us do. So. <laughs> <laughs> and this place is in the Pilgrim Congregational Church on Main and... Gardner, 911 Main Street. Right next By to Moynihan's. Right next to Moynihan's. And so people should come by here at noon on a Sunday. Yeah. And then go woo dot daddy waffles right after. Or oh, that's right, because... Right before. Yeah, I, was, yeah. I would go before because it's yeah. pushing a little bit to go after. Yeah, what do, if, if people, Eric, if people come here on a Sunday, what are they going to, what's going to, what are they going to see? Um, you're going to see, like you said earlier, a lot of people our age. Mm -hmm. And um, we do usually an opening song. Well, I should say the service is about an hour and 15 minutes long. Um, there's one song at the beginning, which we you know, encourage people to sing together. Of course, you don't have to. If you don't want to, it's fine. And then Lucas will uh, share a talk, which is usually on a relevant topic to our lives. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then after that talk, we sing several more songs, about 20 more minutes. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess 
that's it, right? Yeah. People go out to eat afterwards. People go out to eat. Um, and so if you're looking for um, more than that, there is opportunities to get prayed for. Um, during our services, we have a group of people who, um, who do that. And I think, yeah, I think that about covers it. There's lots of information about our church on our website, thewoo.org. So mm-hmm. it kind of gives a rundown of that service and other things we're doing. One of my favorite parts is the About Us uh, and then the tab uh, Videos We Like. It's just some videos that we like. kind of gives you a feel of some of the things we like. Mm-hmm. I was thinking earlier, you guys were mentioning, you found people that have similar values. And that was a buzzword in my mind because I think like moral values or like values-based political kind of things. I'm like, I don't think that's what the, the idea that you guys meant, is it? No. Okay, really. I didn't think so. So I think, yeah, like, what, what's important to us are things that would probably be important to a lot of people in the community, again, in or outside of a faith context, which is mm-hmm. why it's just us type of thing. I want to ask you guys one question, then I want to talk about meeting people in Worcester. This is actually a question which we ask a lot of guests on the show. I'm only going to ask Lucas. If you other guys want to answer this question, give me a little sign <laughs> off the camera, and I'll ask it to you, too, because I forgot to ask mentioned at the beginning before we started taping. How much can you bench lifetime? One rep max? One, I think it was 335. I actually did twice. That's a record, right? That is a record for the show. Record, yeah. That is the record for the show. I was show. a football player. More than Jim Kirsten, more than Bill Coleman. Beat him, yes. Sorry, Rivera, we still don't college. know. Well, don't get Jose Canseco on the show. I'm going to be like blown away. I'm ready to have Canseco on the show. Um, somebody, somebody said, somebody said, you know what, you guys should talk about how, how do you people meet people in Worcester? And like, we 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 have like almost no time left. So I'm Brandon. Yeah. So I'm just going to quickly summarize this. Like we were talking about, you know, if you grow up in Worcester, you have your friends who you grew up with, and you have all, all these people. Maybe it's hard to meet people outside of that group. And if you come from outside, like how do you meet people in the city? Like me, I'm not a very social person, but I moved moved two minutes. Two minutes. I moved into the Catholic Worker when I first came here. So I was basically living with like two people who were super outgoing, super active in the community, had lived here for 20 years, introduced me to like literally 50 people the first afternoon I was in Worcester. So it's an easy thing. My suggestion is, A, if, the, if, if what we've been talking about here today with the woo means something to you, you should come here. This is a great place. B, if you see me, you should come talk to me. I am totally going to volunteer my services, my matchmaking services to you. Do not email me. Do not call me on the phone. We need to have this conversation face-to-face. If you see me, come up to me and say, I'm curious about that. We'll talk about where you're at, and we'll see if we can source, source some people for you. Brandon was also mentioning if you, if you should go down to the Abbey, and if Joe Scully is behind the bar. We haven't asked him about this, but I bet you Joe Scully would help you with this also, or would be interested to get involved in your problems. <laughs> we got a, uh, we got a, yeah, a couple yeah, of no, and I'll be happy to take up the reins on that as well too. I mean, I, if people yeah, see it, Brendan around town, probably not going to happen, but sure. Um, you yeah, know, it, it, that's a weird conversation though, and I, it's one we should probably flesh out a little bit more in another show. I, I mean, this is as, Worcester is a very inviting city, uh, and a lot of people do feel as though they get stuck here when, when they come here, yeah. not necessarily in a bad way, yeah. but uh, it's really it is not an easy place to network because it's an old school city, we're an old school working class city where a lot of uh, relationships were formed uh, early on in people's lives, and it's a tough nut to crack at times. Yeah. You know, I, I was just reading this, uh, this awesome study a couple weeks ago. It was basically focusing on Facebook and the question of, like, does Facebook, like if you're hanging out all the time on Facebook, do you have less friends as a result? And the answer is actually no, that the more people are using social networking stuff, that actually tends to build their mm-hmm. communities. But in general, for decades now, the amount of social connections of the average American has gone down. So mm-hmm. it's true that we are a less social, less connected society. I mean, if you're using Facebook, you're maybe, you know, this society is doing this, and you're maybe doing a little, like, like this at a little bit less. <laughs> so I would be, I want to read more of the data about what this, what's going on with I'd this. I'd be really curious to hear. I, again, I'm not social, but I do feel like I like meaningful. Everybody likes meaningful connections. I don't need a hundred friends. But that's but what I was going to say. I'd be really, five good friends I'd be really is perfect. curious to see what, what they were defining as friends, right? Like yeah. whether just an acquaintance, uh, but someone that you know something about or like a, a really deep relationship with somebody. You know, the difference between friends and buddies, right? We've got 35 seconds. So I'm just going to say four and three and two and one. Here is Eric, Brendan, good night. Joy, Lucas, I'm Mike Benedetti. Thank you for watching the show. You can email us at pieandcoffee at gmail.com. This is 508. We'll talk to you next week.